So here we are with Jason Black, the mountaineer from Donegal, Letter Kenny. Jason, it's a Saturday before Sunday. First of all, let me shake your hand. Uh, we have all your children with you. Do you want to say who's in the room with us here today? Yes, it's Billy Black and we've got Ella Black and uh, Laura, my oldest girl, and Kate next in line. So, you know what, just putting in some family time at the minute and loving just uh, having this opportunity to share share the thoughts the day, the eve before the, the huge climb. So. Well, you're a good man for coming out because I'm sure there's 101 things that you could be doing with your time. First of all, you look like you're in peak condition. Mm, great, in great shape now. I have to say I've worked. Really hard. Um, I'm now a year and 10 days into my training program. I'm officially finished from yesterday, so I'm just downtime at the minute. Bags are packed, bit of a numbing experience looking at those bags. Um, you know what? The whole process is a bit numbing because, you know, for you, for, you know, I joined an international team over a year ago and, um, you know, you're, you're actively working towards this huge climb. You're not really letting it in too much into your body. You're just getting the body prepared and then. Um, you know, from a physical point of view, I've put in four hours a day, six days a week. I've stayed injury free for well over a year. Um, so the innings is in there from a physical point of view. From Christmas, I've been working very hard on the mental preparation. That's what I was going to ask you. The physical is one thing, and you have no problem with that. Do you know training twice a day or whatever, maybe three or four hours? But mentally, how do you how do you get your head around that? Mentally, it's just about looking back inside. I mean, I have a strong belief in me, Jason Black. I mean, and it must start there. Um, you must believe in yourself. I mean, that is the uh, key to the the whole process. Um, once I have that done, it's a matter then of spending good, strong, positive time, surrounding myself with good, positive people, um, storing good, positive experiences and memories, locking them into the mind, uh, Lee, and um, and then pulling them out. Then uh, when they're required, when things are really tough on the mountain, and that could be. Um, colors reds um, that could be dark browns oranges that could be a wonderful swimming garden to a kayak to uh, a laughter it's happening in the background maybe somebody else's conversation but you've picked up on the tone of the laughter and you've just locked it in and then whenever things are really tough and so isolated on a mountain that you can just look back inside pull that out of uh, your mind and it just gets you over that blip that you're having on the mountain Jason, a few weeks ago, I would say it was about three or four weeks ago, Netflix, I was watching The Killer Summit and you only announced last week that you're going to try to, um, and hopefully, and will do, uh, climb Summit K2. Mm -hmm. It's a big mountain. And I remember one of the guys in the documentary, and I watched it last night, I was saying to you earlier, one of the guys was saying like, Everest is a big mountain and it's great achievement in that, but it's something that you say around a dinner party and, a, you know, creates a great buzz. But K2 is for real mountaineers. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Like, don't get me wrong. I mean, Everest was Everest and Everest on the north side was just amazing. It was an incredible climb. And, uh, you know, I'm forever debted to having that incredible experience and that view um, coming away from that. And then, I mean, we all know as mountaineers that K2 is the daddy of the whole lot of them. K2, um, while, while it's the second highest mountain, it only, it's only um, 150 metres below the summit of Mount Everest, but it's 20% steeper. It's a really technical climb. It's 180 miles more north of Everest. It's not It's not a Joe Blog climb. Um, it does involve a lifetime of training to prepare for it. It is numbing when you, when you realize, you know what, I'm going to the Olympics and I'm going for gold medal. And that's what it feels like in the mountaineer circles. Well, Jason, do you know, making the summit is one thing, but it's, most of the accidents and deaths happen on the way down. Is that because people are more relaxed, they're exhausted? Why does that happen? Yeah, I mean, exhaustion's a huge element. You know, I mean, once you enter, um, you know, the preparation from camp one to camp four and doing the rotations and allowing the body an opportunity to kind of acclimatize and to adapt to the air pressure and the lack of oxygen uh, is one part of it. But once you enter 8,000 meters, it's extremely hard to, to articulate what that's like to somebody. But the body's in free for all. The body doesn't want to be there, and the mind certainly doesn't want to be there. The lack of oxygen I recorded above eighteen thousand, sorry, above eight thousand meters was down as low as fifteen percent oxygen in the body. And if that was in ICU and Letterkenny, you'd be hooked up to the machine. So you're trying to keep your body mentally and physically stable and well and safe. Um, and you're trying to make good, strong, conscious decisions at that point um, as you're moving through the mountain and. Um, the descent, as you asked, I mean, you know, that final day, we're probably somewhere in between 18 to 21 hours. The body is shut down from 8,000 meters. It's made a decision with the amount of oxygen that's available that it's only given the supply to the brain and the heart and the lungs. 
already it's not given anything um, to the other organs as in the kidneys and liver so they're already failing the digestive system is shut down completely so any food that you're absorbing is not going into the nutritional gain so you're now starting to eat your own muscle so that's why we lose possibly two stone weight on this climb would you have to bulk up muscle wise then when preparing for the climb no i've left myself really lean and i've left myself um very fit for this i mean i don't want to carry too much weight into it um because ultimately i've got to climb high and i've got to climb very steep but i'm going into this climb a little bit um on, on the lighter side than i did from any of the rest of them so that make, means that i've got to be really aware of my food intake i can't i don't have the extra calories to allow for an extra burn so i've got to even sure that I mean, generally, I burn about 7,000 calories per day on, on these massive climbs. So I've got to be consuming somewhere between seven and 10,000 calories. And then going back to what I said earlier on with the body not wanting to digest and not wanting to consume food, start to think what that's doing to the body and start to think about the muscle wastage that's starting mm -hmm. to happen. And it's not wastage as in it falls off you. What is actually happening is the body starting to cannibalize itself. So the body, when it runs out of carbohydrate, it starts to turn to the protein, which is the muscle, and just starts to eat the protein. So you actually start to eat yourself. Not only do you need to be a great climber, but you need to be a, a dietitian by the sound of things. Yeah, you've got to have a really good understanding of you as a person. And I mean, this is, I mean, being in 44 years of age, and it's the most perfect age for taking these things on from two points of view. One is physically, I have an incredible understanding of my body. I've spent a life in sport. Um, and through that foundation of cycling and swimming and, and running and, and in the mountains, um, you know, I've known what works for me. I know what uh, what my body responds to, um, and I know really how far I can push it. Um, mentally, that's been the same battle. Um, but again, the the one of the biggest strengths I believe that I take into these big mountains at forty four is having a life of a mortgage, kids, dealing with debt in the past, having had experience of death, losing key members of my family, having had tough experiences in my own lifetime my own lifetime that's possibly knocked me to my to my feet and leaving me no other choice or well leaving me with two choices thankfully i chose the right one which is to get back up again and to continue fighting and um those type of situations will re uh, create themselves again on the likes of k2 where i will be knocked to me to, to my knees and um i have to look back inside again and as we said at the start of the interview look back into that self-belief and being able to just say, no, come on, um, you know, you've been here before, uh, as tough as it's been, get to your feet. And um, it gives you that uh, will to live and live uh, and, um, and that will to survive. How important is your climbing partners in that? Because I was watching the documentary last night at the Killer Summit, as I mentioned before, and there was 11 or 13 people, I think yeah. you corrected me on that, um, that passed away up on the mountain but like there's a bottleneck there there's a big queue it was perfect weather conditions it was like a day in the million they said how important are the people that you're climbing with oh they're they're really important i mean there's 40 climbers going in to take k2 on this year there's four teams um all world class i mean even even to get the permit to climb the mountain um from the aviation company and or the civil aviation in pakistan was phenomenal i had to have a criteria uh, and a foundation and climbing all my life in order for them to say okay we're going to allow you to climb it and even i had to do an, an interview in the pakistani embassy and uh, with the consulate to give me visas because again they don't want just people going in there and them having to pick up the baggage going to the team members critical i'm on a team of six they're all world class four of them are professionals four of them are, are sponsored athletes and that's what they do for a living but again, for me, that was incredible because it meant that, you know, I had to be at their level. Um, it made me look at myself and say, well, look, I have to be a world class climber. I have to be at this level in order to be on this team and in order to be um, a strong player in the team. Um, yes, it does come down to you as an individual. Um, you have to be mindful of yourself and your own behaviors. Um, you have to be really careful about your own health and your own condition and your own welfare. But at the same time, I am part of a six man team and, and you know, I, I'd like for them to be looking out for me and I'd be looking out for them with altitude. We suffer some, you know, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, where the lungs fill with fluid and the brain can swell very, very quickly on mountains like this. And these are conditions that as a climber, you, it's very hard for you to spot them and you really rely on the, the, um, the other um, climbers to, to spot that. And one of the climbers 
uh, quite quickly. Um, Monique Richards is um, number two in the world. She's the French Canadian climber. She'll be if she's successful. I don't doubt she won't be, but she'd be the first Canadian to be successful on the mountain. And um, when I was in Everest, um, Monique collapsed uh, at eight thousand two hundred meters, and um, she was dead practically on the mountain. And I, I was the climber that came along and saved her life, and got oxygen into her, and um, I got another climber to take her back down again when I was going on to the summit. And I'm not going to meet Monique until Tuesday morning, and she doesn't realise that I was the climber that actually turned her. That'll around. be a, nice to be a fly in the wall there, wouldn't it? Yeah, that'll be interesting because um, I've heard her documented on um, on different sky uh, pros, yeah, programs and stuff, and she doesn't know that it was me, the other, her other team member, that it was me that was there at that time. So that'll be an interesting meet. Because when some like when accidents happen, do you know you're not? They say you're not really supposed to help out. You got to look after yourself. Is that the case? Yeah, look, you know what? The human side of you wouldn't let that happen. But when you're in an environment like that where you're literally just alive yourself, I mean, it's very hard to comprehend what it's like at 8,000 metres. You're just, you have enough oxygen to keep yourself going physically. You have enough oxygen just to be making the right decisions at the right time. You, there's a bit of an outside body experience where you're you're on the outside looking in, and that's very true. Um but look, you know, personally, I couldn't pass somebody. Personally, I would have to try my best to um, to help them. Have I passed people? Yes, I have. Those people were dead already. Those people were literally gone. I couldn't have done anything to help them. On the last climb, I lost five climbers. And I just had to say another father and say goodbye to them. You know, and that was very challenging. Um, not at the time, but more so when I came home trying to process that. But look, I, I hope I don't have to deal with those uh, conundrums, Lee. Um, the statistics tell me that out of the six it was going, Two of us aren't coming back. It's a one in three um, death rate on the mountain. Um, I don't want to be one of those. Yeah, of course. And it must be really tough, you know, for the family. I'm looking at your son and your three lovely daughters here and they're athletes in their own rights here and your wife, Sharon, and that. Yeah. Do you know, you couldn't do it without the support with them? No, it's a really good question, Lee. I mean, um, you know, I, I need the full support of the family. I, you know, for me to ask Sharon to, to let me go and follow my dreams and my aspirations in life was huge. Uh, for her to understand it is even bigger. Um, and the kids are the same. They're at an age now where they can understand what's going on and ask the right questions or choose not to. But they're certainly listening to the conversations. Uh, they're listening to the statistics. Um, I'd like for them to know that, you know, I'm going to take the right measured steps to be successful and success for me. Lee is sitting back here having an interview with you in September telling you how, how magical the journey was. That's the true summit success. There's no ego involved here. There's no, um, you know, if you want an ego, don't go to K2. Um, it's not the place to try to achieve something like that. This is a personal journey. Um, the journey I want to share with people when I come back. Um, I am, without a shadow of doubt, Lee, indebted to Sharon and to the family for allowing me to, to do this. Um, you know, I'm going into it wide-eyed open. Um, myself and Sharon have a promise made to each other that, you know, if I get to a stage on the mountain where it's not making any sense and that things aren't working out, I'm going to turn around. I'm because they do talk about summit fever. Have, have you ever had summit fever before? Yeah, I've had summit fever uh, where I've stared the summit in the face and I've pushed on and I've pushed on and I've put myself in compromised positions and thankfully for me I've got out of them. But um, the last one was last year crossing the Arctic when I was in Denali, 20 hours to go. You know, uh, I was down to one hour fuel left, or sorry, one day's fuel left. I only had half a day's food left. There was a storm coming in that night. I had got a message in from the park rangers on a small uh, small radio that I was carrying telling me there was a storm due in two hours. They didn't know how long it was going to last. I All I needed was 20 hours, and this would have been in the bag. I'd spent two months out there uh, climbing, 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 got myself into this position. I'd been pushed back with weather for weeks and I had chosen not to give in and then I was staring the demon in the face and that night if I had made the wrong decision which would have been to stay now there's no doubt I wouldn't be having this interview with you tonight and from packing my bags uh, putting the tent away putting the gear away turning me back on on a mountain that I really wanted to um, to be successful on and you within an hour had made the right decision and to be honest with you um, and you had become I suppose in essence the true mountaineer been able to walk away and uh, live to fight another day. The mountain's going nowhere. It'll be there and it'll be challenged at some later, later date. But, I mean, I have so much respect for Mother Nature. I have so much respect for the mountains. Um, and I have also respect for me as an individual and I must respect 
um, I must respect the gift that my wife gives me, which is the freedom to go and do them. And I can't disrespect it. Can't see, uh, can't see even my own wife. Can I go? No, no, I hope in hell. So good on Sharon. When do you hope to summit? I know it's all weather permitting and stuff, but they say, you know, July is the month to do it because August is a lot more dangerous with the avalanches and that. Well, look, you know, you know, for, for people that doesn't really follow huge mountaineering um, mountains, I mean, the likes of K2 will give me a window of two weeks. The monsoon will lift. Um, I'm getting my weather again and from Switzerland this year. I will be following the jet streams and we will be able to um, have an idea of when the weather is going to move in our favour. There's probably two weeks of a window uh, when we can actually summit. Um, the expedition is 76 days long. Um, you're right. Um, it's all weather dependent. Uh, we need the moons to line up. We need uh, the health to stay well. We need the mind to stay safe. Uh, we need to be in the right place at the right time uh, to be able to strike. Um, so it's a it's a game of Russian roulette. I mean, there's there's no highway up here. I have to put an army on fixed lines. There's no fixed lines. Keep That's a question I was going to ask you because when I was watching the documentaries, and do you have to put down your own lines? Everything you do, you have to establish your own route. The most beautiful thing about K2 is that it's only in recent years that it's been um, successfully summited. It's only 1954. I was the first person ever to be successful. And so that's relatively fresh in, the, in terms of mountaineering. So the wonderful thing about K2, and indeed the north face of Mount Everest, was that there was no commercial avenue. There's no highway. There, It's literally as it was day one. And that's from a pure perspective of climbing. That's incredible because it's you and the elements. It's you making the decision, do I go left, do I go right? It's you making the decision, what's my correct route at that moment in time? It's what you're seeing in front of you. So there's nobody there with their hand out saying, come on, come with me, I'll show you how to get to the top. Um, yeah, there is a route and, and uh, you know, we are blessed um, to be in the footsteps of incredible mountaineers and adventurers and that's gone in front of us. And they're the true adventurer, you know, the likes of Mallory and, and uh, even Jerry McDonald um, that's gone uh, before me. Uh, those people are, are true giants in the world of climbing and I'm blessed to have people like that that have shown me the way and indeed improved equipment and gear and and uh, I've got to haul all that the whole way up but you know that's I'm looking forward to the challenge and I'm really up for it um, and I'm going to do it cleverly I'm going to do it successfully and I am going to do it there's not a single there's not a single thread in my body that that uh, that doesn't tell me that I'm not going to be successful. Well, Jason, I'm delighted that you're here today with your kids and that, uh, sharing your story and um, before you commence tomorrow. Um, good for the listeners of Highland Radio out there. We're going to be following uh, and catching up with you every day. Can you tell us what you'd be feeding back on a daily basis? Yeah, look, you know, it's, uh, what's really important for me is that I really want to take the people of Ireland and particularly the people from my community with me on the expedition. And um, I want for them to challenge themselves in their own way. And if my expedition helps them challenge themselves, then it's been it's, it'll be magical. And I think if 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 the listenerships can open their mind to their own expedition uh, as as we go on expedition, I think they'll get something out of it. What I'm going to do for the first time on my expedition is I'm going to be putting an audio blog out every day. So there'll be a a one minute dispatch um, where you'll get a live feed or a a recorded feed from me. Uh, telling you where I am, how I'm getting on, what the weather's like. Uh, no doubt they'll hear the surroundings in the background and the wind kicking up. You'll possibly, as the mountain grows and as I grow in height with the mountain, the body will break down and how that's happening, um, how my health is, what type of a state my mind's in. You know, uh, I know from, from being super high that the mind's in a very distressed state at times. So I don't doubt that that'll come across in the audio. And um, there's one thing in reading something and there's another thing in hearing something. So... Um, I'm but you're saying even in, in the tone of your voice, will you know we'll be picking up every, we'll be sensing things, you know. Yeah, and that's going to be great. And you know, it's wonderfully uh, you. I mean, uh, that you've taken this opportunity to share it with the listeners, and I like I really applaud the likes of Hen Radio and, and indeed all the other media stations that are supporting it, that um, that they're getting behind it. It's it's a wonderful success um, in 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 sporting terms, um, but the success is, is sharing it, and the and, and the success is getting something from it. So. I'm really appealing to the listeners and to, to people out there to come with me on expedition and open their own minds to their own challenges in their own life, not to be afraid of them, and uh, this summer um, to really step forward and take on something for themselves. Well, good man yourself. There's so many more questions I could ask you, but I'm going to have loads more when you come back from yeah. K2. Well, Jason Black, put your hands there. I know time is uh, precious with the kids and, and the wife and that. Good man yourself, Jason. Looking forward to it. I'll talk to you in September.